Okay, here's the fourth installment um, for the lecture on culture. In my attempt to make up for all these weather and snow days that we have missed class. Um, and again, you have this. I should have emailed these PowerPoints to you. And if not, you'll have hard copies if you don't already very soon. Um, but you, uh, I will make sure that I've emailed these to you guys. Um, for many years, and, and your textbook talks about the different types of societies. Um, and I realize this may not be the most exciting part of a lecture for culture. Uh, but it's important to understand the development of different types of societies. So we're going to kind of take a, a look historically at that. And I'll do my best to make this um, uh, palatable for you folks. Uh, for many years, the pattern of social structure was identical. Uh, most people would farm, uh, in, and they would barely have enough to survive. There were a few elite people at the top who could uh, extract enough surplus or overage to live differently and better with less work. Uh, a few images there. So, we've come a long way in terms of uh, food production and, and subsistence technology. We'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. Uh, but cultural evolution. Uh, this is a model for the development of society that delineates a sequence of cultural changes over time. And we'll talk about this. Uh, these first models suggested that culture change moved in a, in a direction from simple to more complex. So the idea that culture starts off as, as very simple, moving into more modern types of societies like we live in today, uh, being much more complex. Uh, unilineal evolution. This is an early school uh, theorizing that all cultures proceed through a series of successive stages. Kind of like when we talk about in psychology, you know, how people kind of move through different stages of development. Well, here in sociology, we're kind of talking about the idea that each culture proceeds through these series of stages. And this was stimulated by Darwin's book, Charles Darwin's book on the origin of the species, which discussed biological evolution. Then we have the neo-evolutionary model. Now, this model of cultural evolution is based upon types of technology and food procurement strategies and the socio-cultural adaptations that resulted from them. So now we're focusing more on uh, subsistence technology or food producing um, technology. A child who is an archaeologist uh, posits that major technological developments were responsible for cultural growth. So as technology advances, as we move from more primitive types of societies like hunting and gathering societies to horticultural and pastoral societies with the domestication of animals, and then we move into industrial uh, or rather agricultural societies, uh, the invention of the plow, the horse-drawn plow, and then we move into industrial societies where you have technology increasing even more where people are working in factories as opposed to working on farms. Um, these technological developments are responsible for cultural growth and complexity. He also believed that environmental factors could stimulate these adaptations, as well as impeding uh, cultures from growing. So some cultures become stagnant, again, based on some factors. Now, Gerard Lenski is a guy, I don't know that he's mentioned in your book, a lot of these slides you have so you don't have to write much down, uh, the struggle for resources, like Thomas Malthus before him, he noted that our reproductive capacity um, exceeds our productive capacity. So uh, we reproduce as human beings more quickly than we can produce food, basically is what that's saying. Um, it's just a normal feature of nature. Uh, so that sort of prescribes some people to uh, misery and starvation, according to some. Because when you have more people than food, well, that's kind of what, what you get. Now, ecological evolutionary theory. Uh, this kind of comes from the insights of Malthus. Uh, he was an economist and a demographer from the early 19th century. Um, from Malthus, Lenski bars the observation that human societies are a part of the world of nature. Like all forms, uh, like all life forms, humans have a reproductive capacity that exceeds subsistence resources in the environment. Again, people grow faster than the environment, which creates a problem. Um, 
Linsky concludes that human populations tend to grow until they come up against the limits of food production, and then they, they're sort of put in check through starvation, uh, famine, death. Now, a society, we talked about this earlier, refers to a group of people who interact in a defined territory and share a culture. And Linsky speaks specifically about what he calls, and I've used these terms already, but now we're going to define them, sociocultural evolution and subsistence technology. Linsky stresses that with sociocultural evolution, that changes uh, occur as a society gains new technology. So technology is sort of the driving force that causes cultural change. And certainly you can see where that could be true. Uh, 30 years ago, before cell phones, people actually would sit down and talk to each other face to face. And they would sit down and have dinner with each other. They would, they would speak uh, or get on a telephone <laughs> after work and, and call each other. Uh, as technology has advanced, now people have relationships without ever even seeing each other. They, they call each other, they text, they Skype. So that has changed our culture in terms of how relationships start and work. The advent of online dating and people start relationships and fall in love and never meet. Uh, maybe even for several years because they've been talking online, chatting online, Skyping, whatever the case may be. So that's an example of how technology can create cultural change. Subsistence technology, we're talking about food producing technology. Now there are five types of societies and I'll, I, I'm required to go through these so I want to do that with you. And the book talks about them as well. So we'll start with the hunting and gathering societies. The simplest of all societies. Um, from the time our species appeared and there's some debate about when that actually occurred, um, all humans were hunting and gathering societies. Um, hunting and gathering societies, they would use simple tools to hunt animals and use simple tools to gather vegetation. So, give you a second to kind of capture that. So there's an image, you don't actually have this in your PowerPoint, but there's an image of uh, hunting and gathering. Um, some of these slides you won't have, uh, some of them you will, but that's okay, don't, don't spaz. A um, hundred years ago, there were still larger numbers of, of uh, hunting and gathering societies, both in the New World and in Australia, and smaller numbers in uh, southwestern Africa, in parts of the rainforest in Central Africa, in certain remote areas, remote areas in the southeast of Asia, um, and neighboring islands in Arctic Asia. Uh, this slide you do have. Um, and a few things to fill in. Settlement patterns, uh, they were nomadic. They moved around. There were only 25 to 40 people in a settlement as opposed to like in today's society that we live in, in an informational society, um, millions of people could, could be living in a settlement. Social organization, they were very family-centered, very cooperative, a division of labor by age and sex. Um, basically, the men were hunting and the women were gathering. Uh, you had to be family-centered and you had to be cooperative. You had to count on each other's abilities and similarities for survival. Uh, because if all the men hunt and you know one man is different and doesn't want to hunt, well, and he doesn't, that could be the difference in the society eating or not eating for that day or that week or that month. Uh, very little social inequality. There's a low division of labor. There are not a lot. Of, there are not a lot of different jobs you could do in these types of societies. You don't have teachers and lawyers and doctors and cab drivers and, and you know, whatnot. You basically have hunting and gathering. So there's some examples there for you at the bottom. Now, horticultural and pastoral societies. This is these represent the next type of society as we progress through history. And there are still some societies that are hunting and gathering and horticultural and pastoral even today. Um, societies utilizing horticulture. Horticulture is the use of hand tools to raise crops. Pastoralism is the domestication of animals. And these societies developed about 10,000 years ago. So there's an image there that you probably don't have. But at any rate. Uh, horticultural and pastoral societies. Uh, the settlement patterns. The horticulturalists form small settlement patterns that are more stationary, while pastoralists are more nomadic. So in other words, the horticulturalists kind of stay put more but the pastoralists, with the domestication of animals, they're moving around more. So now we're moving from 25 to 40 people to several hundred people in a settlement. So we're growing the size of settlement patterns here. Uh, social organization, they're very family-centered still. Now we start to see the, the development of a religious system. 
Um, moderate specialization, so there are different types of jobs, different types of things that people can do. And we're witnessing an increase in social inequality because when you create more positions for people within a society, we start assigning status to those positions and we start ranking those. So there's, we start to see the beginning of social inequality. Uh, some Middle Eastern societies are still horticultural and pastoral. Then we move into agrarian, or I'm going I'm to refer to these as agricultural societies. Um, these are societies that utilize agriculture. Um, the animal-drawn plow was the big invention that kind of uh, uh, began this, this type of society. Agriculture, we're talking about large-scale cultivation using plows, uh, harnessed to animals or more powerful energy sources. And these the societies, uh, societies developed about 5,000 years ago. So there you see. Uh, the settlement patterns in agricultural societies, cities actually start to become common. So we're seeing not just little settlement patterns within the countryside, we're seeing uh, cities where, where people are starting to reside. So we're starting to see a major shift in population distribution. But still most people are living in rural areas. Now you have millions of people, not just a couple hundred, in a settlement pattern. Uh, the family starts to lose significance here because as population is growing, as population is being redistributed from the countryside to cities, um, people are moving away. They're not staying home working on the farm as much. They're working in cities, and we're going to start to see the uh, we're going to start to see factories and industry come after this type of society. So people are not as connected to their families. Distinct social institutions begin to develop, religious, political, economic, etc. We start to see an extensive specialization or division of labor. So you have more jobs, more positions that, 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 that you can hold, that people can hold within a society. And the more jobs and the more positions you have, the more social inequality you have. Because again, we're assigning status to all these different levels and jobs and positions. Uh, example would be the Middle Ages in Europe, uh, and even today, non-industrialized societies of the world. Uh, are still agricultural. Now we get into the Industrial Revolution. Really the shift from rural agricultural economies to industrial societies. Industrialism is the production of goods using advanced sources of energy to drive large machinery. So we're seeing machinery really kind of take the place of, of animals and people. Uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, we could debate when it started. Generally it is agreed upon that it started about 1750 in Europe. Um, so we're starting to see, again, major shift in human population uh, distribution here. Uh, so advanced sources of energy and mechanized production. So you start to see cities and industry develop. Uh, in industrial societies, settlement patterns, cities now contain most people. And people move around. You have millions of people, not just 25 or 40 or a couple hundred or even several thousand. You have millions. Social organization, very high specialization. In industrial societies, you have people, again, who have all kinds of different jobs, doctors, lawyers, people who pave roads, janitors, teachers. I mean, we could go on and on and on and on. And we assign, again, status to these. Um, and you have a lot of social inequality. But it starts to diminish a little bit in industrial societies. Post-industrialism, this is kind of where people um, put us. Actually, we could argue that we're actually in what's called the information, in an informational or information type of society. Uh, Post-industrialism, technology that supports an information-based society. Um, present to future societies. Now, instead of looking at machines, we're now looking at computers that can support an information-based society. Computers can now do the job of several hundred machines. So, um, so again, we're just we're progressing forward in time here. Uh, the computer has definitely made a lot of things possible. It's freed up even more people from working in farms or on farms or working on machines or even working in cities. A lot of people now can do jobs from their homes on a computer, um, like I'm doing right now. Um, Post-industrial information societies, uh, the settlement patterns, city, cities, sorry, <laughs> can't, I can't speak, cities still contain most people, and people still move around a lot, and there's still millions of people in a settlement pattern. Uh, similar to industrial societies, the social organization of these types of societies, 
Uh, information processing and other service work is replacing industrial production. And you've seen that in West Virginia. 30, 40 years ago, we had a lot of chemical factory jobs. Uh, we were the chemical industry uh, hotbed area um, in this geographical part of the United States. Those jobs have dwindled significantly because we now have computers that can take the place of a lot of the machines that were, that were used to do this kind of work. So information processing and service work, which pays less money, by the way. We'll get into that later. Uh, the United States and Japan today serve as current examples of post-industrial or informational societies. And that's, uh, that's, the, that's it for that part of the lecture. Thanks, guys.